morning and welcome again to the Veterans Forum. Today is the 13th of June 2018 and time is just flying by. I'm Bob Stevens and this show is coming to you from the studios here in Bedford, New Hampshire. We do this in conjunction with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project that started back in the year 2000, wherein they set up a program with the Library of Congress's control to offer every guy and gal who served anywhere in any of the services, if they can and will, share those experiences here in a televised interview. That data will be forwarded down to the Library of Congress and included in their basic program there so that anybody from here on out, once it's in the catalog, can check you out, find out what you did and so forth. The problem we have, though, is a lot of guys and gals, particularly the waves, the wax, the nurses, and the technicians, who did so darn much, but have never wanted to talk about it. We'd like them to come forward. We'll do all we can to make sure that's a good show, but more important, as one fellow told me, a POW, as a matter of fact, he said, this is perhaps the most priceless legacy I can leave my family. I haven't talked about a lot of what we've talked about here today to them, Anytime they want to, they can now check me out. So again, if you can and will, come and see us. But before we go on the rest of the show, I want to show you this. It's a link set up throughout the state of New Hampshire for any guy, any veteran, guy or gal, who served anywhere and had at least six months service and an honorable discharge that you can't see it, but there's some 28 different groups and people who will do anything and everything they can to help you solve your problem. You have to ask for it, but if it's there and you need it, do it. Your friends may think you need some help too, so don't push it off. You'd be surprised what's there just waiting for you. Now today we have another young kid who's going to give us a story of what he did and how he did it. Every one of us has a little different impact, but the basic idea was we had a job to do and most of us did it, and we did it proudly. Okay? I'm going to ask Mo to introduce himself and we'll take it from there, if you will. Name, address, if you will, where you now live, branch of service, and service dates. Mo Fournier. I live in Nashua, New Hampshire. Spell Fournier, please. F-O-U-R-N-I-R, -R, just like a number four. I used to have a number plate which was had four nears. Oh. And I have, a, there's a, I have a little quote on that one. One day someone stopped and saw my, uh, my number plate. And it says, you must be a 49ers fan. I said, no which 49ers were pretty strong at that time frame. But I said, no, my, my, my last name is Fournier, and that's, but we have more people in the family. Really? That's why we have the S. Okay. And I'm from Nashville, New Hampshire. I was in the U.S. Army. I joined in the 1957 until 1960. Okay. And when I originally joined, I was promised the Naval School of Music. After Navy base, school. Navy, yes, because the okay. Army did not have their, their school at that time. And uh, the, Air Force has, the Air Force had their own. Okay. A very good friend of mine joined the Air Force because he wanted to go to school as well. But both of us could not go to the same school because we would probably never end up the same base. No. So uh, I took a little heat in basic training. Whoa, whoa, whoa let's, let's slow down right there. Now we know who you are. I'd like you to hold this up so that people can see what this is the beginning. You get a loud and clear shot of that. That's Mighty Mo. Can you see it well? Okay. That's what used to be. Now you see what is. Let's go back and find out. This is a trip. How did you get to you? Like, where and when were you born? I was oh, born. Oh, oh, wait a minute. And how was your life growing when you first started growing up as a kid? What did you do that made, made you you? Well, that's an open question. I uh, came from a family of four sisters. Only one was younger than I was. So I. When and where were you born? I was born in August 12th, 1939. Okay. Nashua, New Hampshire. Okay, we got that, fine. I had uh, three sisters older than I was, one younger. And uh, my father was a bricklayer. So he had a hard life, in a way. Because back in those days, in the hard winter days, they weren't working. So he had to make sure he had enough food on the table for us. And he always did. He was a good, good dad, as far as I'm concerned. So he had to work a couple of jobs? Uh, he basically did bricklaying. 
But he, his famous thing was fireplaces. That was a specialty. So a lot of friends of his would ask him to. Oh, inside. Inside. Good right. thinking. So uh, I, I miss my dad because uh, when I was in the Army back in 1959, August 1959, August 13th to be a fact, the day after my birthday, I got a phone call from the Red Cross that my dad had passed away. It took a lot out of me that time. Well, yeah. It took me two days to come home, and it was extremely hot here at the time. I think it was like 95 degrees, and the humidity was as high as you can get it. You're jumping too, too yes, far ahead. Right. I, you're going from age three months to 24, 25 years. What I'd like to do is find, what did you do as you were growing up and, and into work with your kids? How were you in school? Were you a good student? Uh, yes and no. I wasn't <laughs> particularly crazy about school to begin with. And why? Why, I don't know. I just didn't have the incentive. But I, I knew what I wanted to do uh, is to play drums because back in those days, the VFW in Nashua used to have a drum bugle corps. Now you see these guys coming down and playing those drums, and I says, man, someday I'm going to do this. And I, I was around 12 years old at that time. So I, I spoke to my mom and dad, and I says, well, we'll see what we can do. So I did start taking lessons, and I had a, a good teacher. And from there I went, I played with some drum bugle corps. One, one was in Milford, New Hampshire, called the, it was the VFW group. I think they call themselves the Hoopers. So that, I did that for a couple of years. And as years go on and I got out, I, I left school early, more so than I wanted to. Okay. I was Let me stop you right there. You're still going big hunks of a lifetime. I want to find out what you did as a kid in school. How were you a good student? What did you do to keep busy doing weight? Did you have a small time job? The, the stuff oh, yes. that made you yes, when? I, you when? I yes, I out. was I was very, very <coughs> busy because I, I got into a newspaper route. I had all the newspapers in the Boston that were that I was delivering, plus the Manchester Unilever. In the afternoon I used to deliver the National Telegraph. Also on Sundays and the Sunday newspapers were they were big because they were thick. Did you have to deliver them yourself? Deliver them a on a bike. wagon or something? Did bicycle. Dad drive you around? Or? No, I was on a bicycle. Oh. And How'd you I, carry a load like that? I put the bags on and over the, the handlebars, and I had some in the back. And now, were I, you a dive bomber? You fling in? Well, I did some of those. Okay. How many did you, did you hit and how many did you miss? Um, I, I was about 98%. Pretty Which accurate. way? 98% <laughs> hit, 98% hitting miss. Them, hitting them. It makes a big difference. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. And I heard about the, the 2% okay. big time. Oh, yeah, you bound it. But especially when it comes to tip time. You? Now, what, what did you get? A nickel, a dime, a copy, or two cents? Well, I believe back then, I'm trying to think. I think the Telegraph was maybe 10 cents a copy, I believe. Uh, Boston Papers were about the same. I'm taking a wild guess here now. Now, how would you get your money? Did they drop a bunch of papers off and you had to pick them up? I had books? to do a collection. Okay, tell us about it. Every week I had to do the collections for the Boston newspapers. Uh, the Manchester the same way, and I believe the National Telegraph was once a month. And there would be some that would avoid you over and over oh, yeah. again. So then I'd have to notify my boss, whoever was in charge of the subscriptions, and they'd give them a call, and usually they'd, they'd come through. Either that or we'd cut them off. Say, yeah, but you lost the money. Right. But I tried to do my best to get to them and to make sure they, okay. they'd pay, because I, I, would, I would tell them this, I would have to stop delivering the newspapers if you don't pay me for it, because I don't get the papers free, you know. But uh, I made enough money that it, originally I bought myself a, a set of drums. Oh, good deal. A regular set. With my mom's help, she took a, lo a loan from the bank, and I paid her. And I, that was, I was proud of myself that I was able to do that, because okay. that's a <coughs> lot of, that's a lot of newspapers that, that I'm collecting. I know it. That's yeah. why I'm asking the question, because yeah. you were a, 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 an entrepreneur, if you will, by then. And I bought some of my clothes as well. Okay, you, you know, chip in chip the house in. too. Yeah, you know, five bucks a month, a buck in the bank, and the rest of the pocket money. Yeah, right. Been down that road, so I know what it's but, all about. But, you know, it's, 
it's it's a good feeling that you, you're able to do something like that. Yeah. And uh, I got a nice letter from the unit leader uh, uh, supervisor. Matter of fact, I still got it on my files at home. That I did so well getting more customers for the for the uh, okay. for the you're Manchester recruiting. unit leader recruiting. Yeah. He says, "God, this might be the beginning of your 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 life." You know, okay. as far as um, making a buck. Making a buck. So. Uh, you know, it's the old saying: you give people good service, yeah. you get what you're going to be rewarded, you right? Get what you give, hopefully. And all works, and all walks, yeah. walks of life. And what kind of a student were you? You, you, you keep indexing yourself. I'm trying to find out when you, from kindergarten up through high school, junior high, and so forth. What did you do? What did you like and didn't like? The early grades, I had gone to a parochial school with the nuns. Everyone went to the nuns if you were Catholic, you know. Then I ended up with the brothers, which was a little tougher. Because they, they didn't tolerate any delinquency there. They, they had no compunction about whacking you either. I oh, would. no problem there at all. And your parents let them get away with it? No. If, they, if, my, fa if my father knew about it, uh, I would get another whack at home. No, I don't mean that way. I mean, but that they, they let them beat you at school or hit you or control you, whatever you want to call it. It's mainly for disciplinary issues you know they, they would do this oh, but for talking or right the, right passing notes. and if it was major then they'd notify your parents okay and then that, you don't want that amen right you know the famous words my mother i was one of six kids wait till your father comes home oh boy the walls would shake when he could feel him coming down the house the, the problem when you probably had the same damn problem i'm taking your time i shouldn't is that uh, you were sent to school you were there to be helped not to be a bother and to do what you're told. Right. And if you didn't, woe we'll be unto you. And you had to be, well, oh, were you a good student Jay, in the activities, like the, the drums in the In school the drums band? I was, definitely in the, in, in the band. Matter of fact, uh, it got to a point that I wanted to leave the parochial school, so I convinced my mom that I think I can do better if I went to junior high, National Junior High, which I did. And my marks did improve there. No. And what I thought was different, uh, you have a homeroom teacher. Uh, homeroom, you'd be there just for, as you start the day off, and then yeah. you had different teachers for all your other subjects. As in a parochial school, you have the same teacher all day long for every subject. Wow. So, you That's know, hard on them as well as you. Correct. But I did improve. I wasn't what you call an A student. A Maybe bookworm? B's and C's at okay. times. Uh, when I really messed up a couple of times, I had a D. Now, do they have a question? In, in the parochial school, do they have anything like manual training classes? You know, plumbing, carpentry, printing, electricity? Not in the, uh, the trades. Not in the brothers. No, I did not have that there, which I liked at, at junior high in, in the city no. of Nashua because I had woodworking, electrical, auto, uh, you know, it was only junior high. Yeah, but it gets, and, keeps you out of trouble yeah. and gave you something to do. I liked the woodworking part. Yeah. I, uh, I was really involved in that. We had drafting as well. And drafting was in, sort of interesting. Uh, I never got into that in future. It's just that it was a good experience oh, to yeah. have. You had to read a good blueprint. Right, right. And that helped a lot because as in the later years when I worked for industry, I, I worked for... Uh, a big company called Sanders, if you heard of Sanders oh, yeah. Associates, and I worked in materials. And you know, when you work in materials, you, you're always looking at different uh, prints, f for what's, you know, different prints that go along with the, p the materials that you, you're, uh, you're working you're, on. You're working on. Yeah. But uh, other than that, I ended up as a sophomore, and when I decided I can't take this anymore, I think the one subject I really didn't. I disliked in high school was geometry. I never could get my hand to it. You know, geometry is just like a uh, Greek to me in a way. I just could not understand it. And I got to a point and fed up and I took a lot of heat why I wanted to quit. From your folks or from your From students? my folks and some friends of mine too. <coughs> but uh, when I ended up in the military, uh, I was at the Naval School of Music and the sergeant that was in charge there convinced me, he says, you can get your GED right here. And I suggest that you do it. Yep. Good piece of paper. And I did. Great. And I was glad I did. He says, I, I, uh, 
I, I, I passed the course above average, he says. So, which meant I was involved with a lot of the things that I probably already gotten in life. That, yeah, you know, practical experience. Practical experience, right. And uh, <coughs> getting back to the school part, that's, that's what happened in those days. But in the future, I did take a few courses in college uh, in the city of Nashua. Uh, and I only took about one year of it. And my, well, my older sister passed away. So what had happened, I couldn't continue for the course. I was looking for going to my associates. Because uh, my wife and I took the two boys that my, daughter, my sister had. Oh, you jumped him. Yes, I know. Well, he, I... Go ahead. I won't interrupt. I'll try not to. Go well, ahead. I'm trying to get the story. It goes back and forth. Okay. Okay. Just let me know when we ping it out. Pong. Right. So back to the school part. I did quit and I did join. And I, that's when I went to see the recruiter in Nashua. His name was Sergeant Raymond. And uh, he promised me that uh, if you pass the audition at Fort Devens, you'll be guaranteed going to the Naval School of Music. And uh, so he took me down there. I passed, no problem at all. And uh, I, I was scheduled to leave on uh, the 23rd of so September. Where and when did you join the service? I joined in Nashua, New Hampshire. Okay, when? Uh, and uh, I joined, it was in September of 1957. Okay, were well you old enough to go in and sign I was 18. in 18? Okay. Right. Because my birthday. 16, 17, 18. My birthday <coughs> was on the 12th of August. So I just turned 18 that year. Okay. So I had no problems getting in because you know, it was legal, you know, legal to join on yeah. my own. And uh, uh, they sent us off from Manchester, New Hampshire, directly to Fort Dix by train. And once we got to Fort Dix, we were there for a few days. They gave us our uniforms and the whole bit. And we were supposed to train there, but they were overloaded. So they sent half of us to Fort Benning, Georgia, and the other half to Fort Gordon, Georgia, which I ended up at. Okay, down integration to the area. Right. In 1957, right. they were still fighting the Civil War down there. I know. I know. And uh, the whole group, I mean, we were, let's see, it was one other guy from Nashua a guy named Dick Leonard, and another guy from Boston, and all the rest of them were from New York City and New Jersey. And uh, you figure, we're all Yankees. So we get down there, they flew us down to Georgia. It was pouring like cats and dogs when we first got there. The DIs were all Southerners, of course, and uh, they called off the rosters, and they gave us the the uh, the word that you know you RAs a regular army. You don't know what you're in for, but you join. You had it. Your USs, which is draftees, you have no choice. You'll have to go through the routine. But your NGs, they call them the National Guard. You guys are no good. You're only here for six months. You figure you're gonna you're gonna have just a, uh, a hell of a time over here. You're not gonna have a hell of a time. In what manner? What what was the threat? Well, is as far as the, the heavy training and the discipline. They're not going to take any guff from any of these young guys. Oh. To what point? Right, right there. I ask it of every guy, and everybody has the same damn quit. We had. What was it like the first two or three days when you went from civilian to GI? I got gotcha. you. How did when you're getting your stuff lined up and getting you signed and tested so forth? And KP, what was your reaction to it? Were you excited, ex scared? I, I was, I wouldn't say scared, but I was saying to myself, do I realize what I got myself into? Now, did I do this to me? Uh, but I signed up for three years. I wasn't drafted, so I got to eat it. I got to okay. do it. I got to yeah. make the best that I can f with it. And, you know, I was a s s scrawny. Now, did you fence, sense any difference between being a draftee and a guy that enlisted? Were you treated any differently? No, I don't think I was. I think okay. we're all treated alike. But I felt the resentment from the draftees that they really, really didn't want to be there. 
and the IRAs, you know, you, you know, you join because you wanted to, you asked for it. So, yeah. uh, my opinion is is that you should be proud that you're drafted or not. You should be proud you're serving your country Absolutely. one way or the other. Yeah. Of course, we were in peacetime at the time, so none of these guys should even have to worry about it. I mean, things can break out, you know that. But uh, I felt that uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm gunning for something because I, I joined for a reason. I joined to That's go to school and music. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, and I got a lot of heat from the other guys. Oh, the Army and the military will never stand up for what they promised. You're not going to go there. And, and I waited. I was patient. And I says, maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not going to go where I'm supposed to go. So after the, the eight weeks of training, we all got our orders. And sure enough, I look at my orders and says, U.S. Naval School of Music, Washington, D.C. Wow. And I Hallelujah. looked at these guys and says, what's this say? And they flew me there. I was the only guy that flew from Georgia to Washington, D.C. to the school. And I don't know where the other guys went. I didn't care. No, you don't have but, to. You is important. But I had a big smile on my face, yeah. you know. And uh, matter of fact, they had, they had shipped me directly to the school instead of going on leave right away. Usually you go on leave. And then report back to the right. school. Right. It was so close to Christmas. <coughs> they says, well, go, send you to your, your, home, your first base. Then from there you can go on your leave, mm -hmm. which I did. And uh, now you went home Christmas. I went home uniform. for Christmas. It was it was fantastic day. You know, I, different. I felt a little different because you know yeah. I, I'm military. You know, you know I, I better watch my and step. You know, it doesn't hurt. And doesn't uh, hurt. of course, my dad was a little proud of me. I, I could yeah. tell that. And uh, when you get home, how did, you, did the family greet you the first time back? I got a, a nice greeting, a good did greeting. You, hey, well, mom, I'm home. What's for supper? You let them know you were coming, or what? Well, they knew I was coming. Yeah, All right. yeah. And uh, and I walked in the door. I says, it was just like old, old things like when I was living there. Yeah, Smell you know? good, look good. Yeah. Huh? I mean, I was I was gone for what, three months maybe, roughly, and uh, it felt good to be home. Oh yeah. But I knew I had to go back, and yeah. I wanted to go back because I, you I was anxious wanted, to get yeah. started at the yeah, school, absolutely. and I was there for until June. Of 58. At the Naval School? At the Naval School, oh, yeah. yeah. How was it living there in the quarters and the food and the training and so forth? We had our own Army uh, element, what they call the Army element, our own quarters. We had to live according to Navy customs, you know, like uh, the fire watch. Everyone had to do fire watch around the clock. And we ate in a, uh, in a Navy mess hall. But Good the, food? Uh, it was good food. They had army cooks that were supplied there because it was a consolidated uh, mess hall. I enjoyed the food. I thought the food uh, at the Navy base was better than what I had in basic training. Because well, you were kind of skinny when you went in, I understand. Oh, yeah, I was 129 pounds yeah, soaking broomstick. wet. Broomstick. <laughs> broomstick, right. And boy, I'll tell you, uh, I did gain a few pounds, I think, by the time I... Uh, I think I got out, I was 145 when I got out of uh, Naval well, School. But I... I like the brunch they had on weekends in the uh, at the Navy base. They have a brunch in the morning. Uh, it's your story. Uh, I have no uh, idea what you're talking uh, about. You know, you can order anything you want oh. all day long. So uh, Open mess? Open mess, yeah. And, uh, of course, we had to log in so many uh, hours of, tr of practice okay, now in the school. Okay, now how did that just learning to play, learning to play while you're marching and marching and so forth. Yeah. Do you go through all that routine? All that routine, basic? yeah. Uh, you know, we, we did a lot of the march. Of course, I was used to marching. Anyway, I was marching in a drum bugle corps. Uh, you know, uh, I was in oh, the yeah. a national school. And, of course, uh, in the military. Oh, matter of fact, if you don't mind me going back again. You go wherever you on want. On basic <laughs> training, they needed someone <coughs> to keep the cadence. Does anybody here know how to play drums? I says, I do. So they had, they picked up a drum somewhere, I don't know where, and I was playing the cadence for them while they were marching. I felt like a big deal. Oh, sure. You know? But... Uh, Did it ever pay off later on? As no, no. Okay, no, no. sometimes those little things add up. Uh, I did get... I, I was a wise guy one time, though. 
Oh. One time with a DI. Perished it. Though. One time. You know, they come up to you in basic training, and this is, what's your name, boy? And I would say, boy. He said, I guess you look like a boy, you know? He said, where are you from? You know, with his slang, you know, and I said, Sergeant, I'm from Sutton, New Hampshire. Well, you wise guy, give me 20. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just thought it was kind of yeah, but comical. Yeah, but things have a way of bouncing back on But you. I found out, you don't do this. No. You don't do this. It's just, yes, sir, and how many? Yeah. But uh, other than that, I got along all right with the, with the training sergeants. You know? well, how did you feel down in, in I'll call it the, the southern states, being a Yankee and still discrimination. It was rare. really odd for me, very odd, because coming from New Hampshire, and, you know, we don't, we didn't have a segregation problem, per se, in New Hampshire, and to see how they're treated, you know, like, uh, they're almost like a different animal or something like that, you know, and uh, when you went into the PX, you s see the black ladies, you know, you ask, oh, this was f kind of funny. When in there, I wanted a frap, and the lady says, what's a frap? This is, uh, it's almost like a milkshake, but it has ice cream in it. Oh, that's still a milkshake. Yeah. That's what we call it here. And I, and I also found out you don't ask for a tonic, it's a soda pop. Soda pop, yeah. So all these different slangs, being 18 <laughs> years old, wet behind the ears, which I wasn't accustomed to, the different living standards out in the South, you know, anything I saw was in the movies, and I always saw it was something segre segregating, you know? So uh, it was an, it was a uh, living experience. Well, did you ever have any trouble uh, making buddies with the fellow, black fellows? Or Not were there many in your group? The, the the ones that were in our group, they were all from New York. I got along well with all of them. You know, okay. up up in you know. The upper uh, New England states, you know, they, uh, well, not only New England, uh, the upper. Upper half. Upper <laughs> half is, you know, we all get along, yeah. you know. But it's a different shock down there. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, I didn't see too many DIs on there that were black. And it was suddenness, big time suddenness. Name of the game. But uh, I was glad to leave there, though. Okay. Now, after your eight weeks of training, what were you qualified to do? Did you have an MOS, like a Navy no, drummer or whatever? My, my, my MOS didn't come into effect until I got into Hawaii. And that's further down the pike Okay, now. it's your story. Uh, and uh, I was mainly an infantryman as I got out of basic training, you know. You have to qualify? You have to qualify. And what? I ended up, I qualified as a sharpshooter <coughs> on the M1. Okay. The old M1. Oh, yeah. The and, baby. You know... Uh, the other thing they had me carry is the uh, the uh, BAR. BAR, okay. And that's a heavy weapon. Oh, yeah, a big one. And for a skinny guy like me, that was kind of heavy to carry. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. Uh, we went to the, uh, the uh, machine gun. The, In the 30s or 50s? The 50s. Okay. And that was kind of a shock. You have to do the crawl under routine? Uh, we were sitting up, actually, on our buns and just... And I, I wish, when you when you were firing that thing, you you really shake. I know. If you I had know. any flies on you, were off. I they know. got off. <laughs> but I wasn't crazy about that one. And then you had the bazooka. It was quite a, a, quite interesting. They don't have those anymore. They have these regular sidearm ones. Though. I'm not sure what they call them now, though. Uh, so many things have improved since I was in. Yeah. I mean, New, figure, better ways to kill. And the main thing that was put in our heads, basically, is to clean that weapon and keep it clean. Oh, yeah. And they kept on telling us, in Korea, the more problems they had there is because the guys weren't cleaning their weapons okay. enough. They lost a lot of guys because of that. That's your baby. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to go into the routine uh, about gun versus the other gun. That's a different story. But... Uh, Basic training was an interesting thing. Right? Going the uh, infiltration course, crawling underneath that, mm -hmm. and seeing these live ammo That's traces right. going on. You're crawling under. You. That was scary. When yeah, they you, told you us, you don't look. You don't get up. Right. You and do. You don't come back You were down. eating that dirt. Yeah. You know. Uh, it was quite an experience. You know. I uh, I'll never forget it. 
But when you throw the, if you will, a qualified infantryman, and then you did your specialty, you went into a new, new outfit, what did you do next? Well, from there, of course, I, I was at the Naval School. Okay. And from the Naval School, they sent me to Dix again to get some additional training because I guess they had a mindset where they were going to send me to 25th Division, which is an infantry outfit. Okay? But they also knew I, I had just come out of school. So he says, that's not a problem. When you get to Hawaii, they'll audition you there, and you'll get in a band. So which they did. And it turned out well for me from then, from then on. And uh, I was so proud of being in the 25th Infantry Division Band because we were almost like jack of all trades. We'd go out in the field with the rest of the division because if war broke out, you're not out there playing your drum and blowing That's your right. horn. You carry a gun. You have to know how to fire for record every year, mm -hmm. which I didn't mind doing. Uh, we had a lot of retreat parades that we played at uh, almost every evening. And back then, the drums didn't have plastic heads like we have now. They have calfskin heads. And a lot of times, we'd be coming back, be a little mist coming down from the skies because Schofield hurt. Barracks is up in the mountains, so you get a lot of rain. So you'd be playing along, all of a sudden, one, one snare drum would be stick all the way through because right through they were all sobbed up, you know. So uh, another thing I learned is that uh, learning how to tuck heads, you know, because you, you, tucking heads is, or is a skinhead you'd have to wet it down and put it on this rim and tuck it in all the way around. And it would, it would uh, dry up overnight so you could play it the next day. And then the plastic heads came out much, much later than that, so you didn't have to worry about busting Any them. difference in the sound? I think the sounds is better with plastic. the plastic heads, yeah. Because yeah. the, uh, the weather will change the, the, the sound of a, of a uh, calfskin head from day to day, depending if the humidity or the dryness, you know, it could be a, it will hit a higher pitch or it would be sobby. I, I like the plastic heads. Once you tune at, they more or less stay in place the way you like them. Good. But uh, I, uh, I got in as a private two when I first got into the band. Within a year, I became a PFC. That was unusual, because in the bands, you don't get ranks at all. And I think it was in 59, uh, I think it was after I came back home. I came home on emergency leave. I was promoted to uh, an E4, and that was... Yeah, E4 is what, sir? Corporal? Uh, uh, the band is a spec, a specialist. Oh, I, I, that, that they are specialist stuff. ranks. Yeah. See, a corporal overranks <coughs> a specialist, because they have NCO experience. Oh, okay. okay. And you don't find corporals in bands at all, and mostly a specialist ranks. You do have sergeants, and there's, you know... Sergeant First Class, Master Sergeants, but they, they have to go to NCO school. You all have to when you become an NCO. You have to go to school. Training. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, in the days I was there, it was all spit and polish in the band. You know, we always kept one pair of boots always underneath our bunks with a stocking around it because yeah. they're all highly polished. So right. the dust won't get on them. So the parade comes along. You're ready to roll. Yeah. And we didn't, uh, the fatigues that we were, we only were on uh, parades like uh, Armed Forces Day parades. Otherwise, we were wearing khakis. Because we didn't have the uh, uh, camouflage fatigues at that time frame. It was all olive drab. And uh, we used to blouse our boots. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and of course, the helmet liners and that's what we wore in the parades. Now, do you have the metal helmets? Uh, I'll call them stainless steel, steel or whatever. The steel parts only, if you were out in the field, you'd be wearing the steel parts. Otherwise, it's just a helmet liner. Okay. Which is a, is a thin, I don't know. It's like pressed wood or something. Yeah, that right. Stuff, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's all spit and polish. Everything has to be brassy. And uh, if it was an honor guard parade, we'd be wearing white laces on our boots. And the... Uh, all the other players in the band were wear white gloves. The drummers didn't because we needed to mm -hmm. hold our sticks. Yeah, yeah. But we had a white, a white blouse and a, and a scarf. A scarf, yeah. And uh, there was one time I, I remember 
we had the, side, the uh, Secretary of the Army was coming to Schofield Barracks. So the night, and that particular morning after the B, uh, we did the pass and review thing, we had a combo in the band, which my sergeant played traps, in other words, in the combo. And the cymbal player played piano. So the night before, the sergeant says to me, he says, we need a cymbal player for the parade because we won't be there. Fournier, you're playing cymbals. Oh my God, I'm playing cymbals. Had you ever trained it at all? No, anybody, well, any drummer can play cymbals. It's no. just the idea of, <laughs> uh, it was rough. And you know, I, I we were That's at- a being stuff. And especially on national anthem, because you gotta, like no. that, you know, it takes a lot out of your arms, I tell you. But uh, we're on a hot sun, we're, we're at attention, listen to the sec Secretary of the, Ar the Army speaking, then it says, pass and review. And as they get ready to step off, I felt like my feet were stuck to the ground and I didn't step off right away. I could hell for that. But what happened? Are you standing in mud or something? I don't know. It's just standing there in the hot sun. And I've never had no. that problem before. Did any of you guys faint? On your... No. Never, never saw a guy pa pass out at all. Oh, that's different. No. But uh, then we did the pass review, we were okay. But uh, I'll never forget that. That was quite those days that uh, you wish it never happened. Now, where is it, were you stationed at that point in time? Schofield Barracks. Schofield, okay, right and, down. Yeah, it's about 25 miles from Honolulu. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the roads were narrow curves going up to Schofield. And today, they got a super highway going right up there. Four lane highway. That's for the tourists. Yeah, oh yeah. I've been back a few times. And oh, you have? Yeah, I went back to the base. I was amazed they were building a brand new barracks. Uh, the barracks that we were in were qu named quads. There were three floors, you know. Qu you know, there's a barracks here, here, here. No, that's what they call a quad. In the middle. And they come in, yeah. And uh, I was amazed when I went back down there. And uh, forget the PXs. It's like it's... It's like a, like a mall, yeah. and they've got Burger King, McDonald's. They got everything. It, they got it. I, said, I couldn't believe how the military has switched over so much, you know. And these guys have got it, and, and you know the barracks. It's not like you're living with a bunch of guys in the barracks. They have individual rooms now. Now, just tell the people about your tea, your, your money pay. Oh, yes, we get, we get to pay on payday. We always get paid in cash. Until they became a state, all our currency was stamped with a big T and an H, territory of Hawaii. And I did not save any one of those bills, and I should have. Oh, yeah. And wasn't even thinking. You know, you're 18, 19, 20 years old. All you think about, you need, need money to go to town. So you need the money. And usually, right after you get through the line, they'd be there collecting for some special uh, fun, either Red Cross or whatever. You know, they always do that. And if you give them a bucket, you didn't give them a bucket too. You got you got the eye from the first sergeant because he wants oh. he wants to get the the, the best. Big buck, yeah. The, yeah, but it's uh, one of those things yeah. you you live with in in the military. No, is there any real I don't know how to better, better just ask it. Uh, special outstanding things or disappointing things or humorous things that happens as you're doing your tour that bring back good memories or otherwise. Well, the, me the memory that I was so proud of is that when they became a state and there was a big celebration in downtown Honolulu, they had the four military bands, major military bands, the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines, march into Honolulu Stadium, which is no longer there. It's now a park. We marched into uh, Honolulu Stadium, and our bandmaster, I'm so proud of, directed the, the four military bands to the national anthem. So that was a big thing, being part of what's happening. 50th state, you know?
Yeah, we have a picture that we're going to show later on. Right. And I got a, a good quote on that one, too. Hawaii, is a, a business in Hawaii called, I think it was a Honolulu uh, music store, uh, were calling themselves the 49th State Record Company. They went... They jumped the gun, oh. and then uh, Alaska became the 49th. So they they had to change their name very quickly. Or oh, move north. Uh, move north, <laughs> right? It's it's ironic the way things have worked out. And speaking about Alaska, there is a, a detachment of the 25th Division in Alaska now. Today. Today. For what purpose? I have no idea because of that. They've expanded their venues, I guess. And I'm not sure what, what part of Alaska they're at, though. But, uh, but you know, that, that being a state, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot that uh, a lady's room is Wahine. A man is Khan, K-A-N-E. I made that mistake at the USO when the first day we arrived. I went to the wrong restroom. You learned a little spell, too, a bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know... It was weird because the day we arrived there in 58, it was August of 58, we arrived at Hickam Air Base. And they says, well, you guys get the whole night off. We'll take you up to Schofield in the morning. Do what you want to do. So I went to the USO on base. And from there we decided, hey, let's go down to Honolulu. So I get down there. Now, how'd you get down there? But you, uh, on a bus. bus? Yeah. They had a, they got a great great bus. It's uh -huh. called the bus. The bus. The bus. And I see these women walking around these nightgowns, which is moo moos. I didn't know what the heck they were. And I see these guys with flowery shirts and, and sandals and I mean, you know, I'm from New Hampshire. I'm not supposed to know this stuff, you know. Why not? <laughs> You're in the army now, you got damn. No, I'm in the army now, right. You got <laughs> found a letter out. and do it right. And what we're noted as Hollies, or, new, or from the mainland USA, H-A-O-L-E is Holly. They always call us Hollies. Male and female? Uh, or just male, male or female, right. Okay. And the local guys down there used to tease me. Oh, yeah, Pupuli Holly. Pupuli means crazy, P-U-P-U-L-E. <laughs> and Why? Why? Uh, because, you know, they, uh, we used to do crazy things when you met up with a lot of local guys. Because we had some local guys in the in, What in do you mean like crazy, though? No. Walk me through that slowly. Uh, pulling, some, pulling some cranks on these guys, you know. It's the same old thing. Uh, military guys like to kid around all the time. Oh. You know, as you well know, you've been in. Not me. I was and an you, angel. Oh, yeah, I mean. You see the halo? <laughs> use it. Stop being clean. Yeah, you usually get paid for, paid yeah. back for it very oh, yeah. quickly. Oh, yeah. And, and in the band, you got a lot of clowns. A lot of clowns in the band. Well, was, one thing I learned about being in the band, everybody gets along well. You know, we all have fun. Right, it's a family. Yeah. And, you know, it's the old thing. If, if one guy does not get along with the rest, you can't make good music. Music with a group comes with everyone harmonious. getting along, yep. you know, in an infantry outfit, you could find a lot of, uh, a lot of disagreements, over disagreements, results in fights. Yep. You don't find that in the band. Never? Very rarely you see guys okay. arguing. Now, do you ever have any prima donnas who thought they were better than they could play? Well, that happens. That happens. No. What do you, how do you treat them? You know, I find the best way of people like that, just plain ignore them. It makes them wonder what you're up to. No, smile and they'll never know what the hell you're That's thinking. right. That's right. <laughs> That's dirty, but you, you, you brought up a point that I, I never forgot about honoring the, the uh, national anthem. And I'm glad I'm bringing this up right now. One Saturday afternoon, a bunch of guys were in a, in a rehearsal room and they started jazzing up the national anthem. Oh. Guess who walks in? The chief warrant officer, the bandmaster. He let those guys know from top to bottom, he don't ever, ever make fun of the national anthem. It's being, it has to be played directly the way it sh should, be. should be. played. And 
I never forgot that. And now when I see what's going on today, if only they knew oh. they should be honoring the national anthem. There's something you either feel or you can talk all day long and never get it across. Yeah. It, you know, they say, well, life has changed. What do you mean life has changed? Morals don't change. Morals stay the same. The way I was brought up, you know? That's, that's life, you know? And they say, well, you're in 2018 now. Things are different. How are no, they different? They're not different. You know? They look that differently. Yeah. And, and I, I have a hard on that. And, you know, I feel all the years that I've been in, the three years I was in the Army, I, I was blessed. And I felt not only blessed, I was totally, totally lucky. I'm a lucky, lucky guy. And the guys I look up to is the guys that serve in Korea and all the other wars, and especially Vietnam, for the, the hatred that was in the public eye back in those days. The lousy press. I, I really, it really bothered me, you know. Yeah. I says, you know, had I re up or stayed longer, that could be me getting treated like that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not fair. And all these guys come home with limbs. But they nest. all weren't mistreated. The early guys were really dumped on. Yeah. I have a brother-in-law that was in the Marines in Vietnam. And he used to be on a helicopter. He was a rescue guy. A medevac? He saw a lot. Amen. He saw a lot. He doesn't talk about it. And, you know. No, is he still alive? He's still alive. He's got terrible knees. His knees are in terrible shape. I uh, should have done something years ago, but that's another subject. But uh, I have to look at him. Uh, I says, hey, Gary, you're the type I have to salute to. Amen. You know, uh, I'm lucky. Knee. Yeah. You know. Now, you said it was a good thing. Now, what did that training do when you got through? What did you then do as a civilian when you, the rest of your life? How did you come along? You jobs and so forth, your family life, you married, you have your yeah, kids? Yeah, as a matter of fact, my wife and I got married in Hawaii, actually. We got married, uh, I had three months left to go. And uh, we were supposed to we get married in 59. But my dad passed away a month before I came home on that. But okay. I came home for before a different that, yeah. issue. <clears throat> So my wife and I decided, let's wait till 1960, and I'll fly out there. Oh, she was back in the States? She was back in the States. Okay. And she, she arrived. Uh, it's kind of, sort of comical in a way, but she flew from Boston to L.A., and from L.A. to Honolulu. And it was a prop cross-country. And they ran into thunder showers between Boston and Chicago. Yeah, I think she in Boston, Chicago, and then L.A. And she was really scared. But by the time she got into L.A., it was Pan Am Airways. It was the best jet airline there was back in those days, 1960. And they were serving lobster salad meals <laughs> with silverware back in those days. From, that'd be from the States and uh, Hawaii. For Hawaii, yeah. yeah. So she really, really enjoyed that <laughs> trip. And... It was weird because I'm, I'm at the airport, and it was just a tiny little airport in Honolulu. I mean, no security per se, you know. You go through the terminal, and you, you see them coming off on the tarmac, and they come, come in, and she walks in. Well, what happened? I'm looking this way, and she's coming out the other door. I, I couldn't figure out which, which door she was coming out of. And from there, uh, local friends help me, uh, we went directly to the city hall and I had made sure that uh, she would know because they told me that New Hampshire is noted for having stamped signatures on the blood samples. Oh. So I, Peggy told him, yeah, I'll make sure that happens. But by the time she got there, we, we went down to the Marysboro. First thing the woman says, that's a stamped signature. You guys can't get married this week. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? What so do you mean, stamp signatures? Somebody's they wanted to sign, a oh, regular sign, hand, hand signature. Yeah, okay. Right. And they were strict on that. So our local friend found out, we'll go down to the court, see what we can do. They said, we can waive this thing. So what they did, we went to her doctor and took another blood test, and they rushed it through. 
because she arrived on a Tuesday. We got married on a Saturday. And we got married at Fort Shafter, which is the uh, headquarters of the U.S. Army Pacific. They have a chapel? Uh, yeah, beautiful chapel. Okay. And they had, I don't know how many steps going up there. It's unbelievable. Uh, I have a picture of, uh, I still have a picture in my wallet of us when we got married. And we'll be, we'll be celebrating our 58th anniversary Monday. Oh, from one bar to the next war, huh? You want to make it permanent now? I think we'll have to. Okay. And what is your family? How about your kids? What, have you, what did you do as a living? What okay. Did you do? I worked, I started working in a shoe store in Nashua. And from there, because I wasn't making enough bread, I ended up, I worked in the machine shop. I took the training program in the machine shop. I worked there for about three and a half years. Uh, I got a little fed up because I was working third shift. That was rough, 12 to 8 in the morning. And I used to play on weekends in the oh, band. Oh, you, you were obviously in a band someplace. Right, right. Okay. So I finally got a job at Sanders. A friend of mine worked there, and uh, I said, Mo, I got a job for you in the stock room. I need a lead man. I'm having problems in the stock room. The guys are raising hell. I need someone that's matured. Oh, you mean the kids? Yeah, the kids mm -hmm. that he has working in there. And he gave me a hefty increase from where I came from the machine shop. And it was days. Now I'm on days. I felt, I felt like a big deal here, you know. So from there, I worked out from the stockroom uh, top guy in there. And I went into materials. I was involved with a lot of different major programs. Materials being what? So it's just a word. What does it mean? What uh, did you do? It means all pieces to build, the built, like sauna buoys. We were building sauna buoys. You need all kinds of individual parts for electrical, okay. mechanical. The stock room? Stock room stuff. All right. you know? okay. And Thank you. the thing I had to make sure these guys understood how valuable that job is. You may think just being a stock guy is nothing. Well, some of these items you have in the stock here takes six, year, six, six months to get for lead time. You don't go around throwing parts across the room and you can drop it and break it. That means we have to, we can't make our schedule on deliveries. And so on the buoys, so someone's life could depend on it. Ooh, correct. And uh, from there, I ended up in the buy-in, buy-in materials. And that was a big responsibility. Are you B-U-Y-A, buyer? A buyer, okay. right. I, last, I lived, I worked there for about 26 years and then I got laid off. They were cutting back, cutting back. No. But within three weeks, I was working again on temp. It was a temp job. I worked at Digital for almost a year. And I was getting, I was doing very well on that because I had a lawyer help me out on when I got laid off. I got a good deal from the company. That wasn't standard? You were suspicious? No. Uh, I finally got my health insurance for life. For my re they, instead of being re instead of being um, laid off, I was turned out as being retired. Oh, I, I had just turned fifty-five, and fifty-five is a magic age for retirees. That's why they want to get rid of you. So I did okay. I uh, okay. Every job that I had afterwards was uh, long-standing, and I was I had good pays. Did one lead to the another? Yep. Uh, when one would uh, extend, you know, once my my job was uh, finished, you know, like a digital, okay, they started laying off. So the first ones that go is the temps, the contract workers. Oh yeah. So the agencies I was going through, I was always lucky to get another job. Within two weeks, I was, I think the most I was out was two weeks. And I was. I was you also it. playing in the band of bands. Still playing in the band. Yeah. So you're moonlighting. Yeah. So the band was fun. Uh, I always felt when playing in a band is, gets to be work, now was the time to quit. Yeah, you just call and, it work, it's no Right. Good. So it's still fun, so I don't mind playing. I'm having you a played, ball. You, you, how long are you and Paul and, and Leo been together? Well, see, I played with Paul much before Leo gone, came on board. We played as a duo, Paul and I, in different clubs. And then Paul got a job um, 
in Lowell, there was a job in Lowell they needed us for a party. It was a, like a French festival. Paul says, you know anyone that sings French songs? I says, yeah, I think I do. His name is Leo Pelletier. And bring him in. And he him also in. plays sax. Give him a call. So from then on, we started playing, and Leo, Leo started playing the sax as well, and we, we played for about, about three, four years, and things happened. We all went our separate ways. Then about two and a half years ago, Leo met up with Paul at one of the restaurants. He said, I know you. And Paul says, hey, you think Mo would be interested in getting together? A little combo. He says, I got a, I got a gig to do a taping at uh, Bedford TV. He says, give him a call. He gave me a call. I said, yeah, I don't mind doing it. So from there, that led to other jobs that we're playing at. We're playing a lot of nursing homes. We even played at the uh, Vets Home there in Tilton a few times. I enjoyed that. That was fun. It's fun up there. Yeah. And uh, it hasn't stopped. We're booked almost every, almost every Friday. Matter of fact, we're playing this afternoon. Oh, that's where you got to get out of here real quick. Okay, right. I'll watch the clock. You've got a minute and 41 seconds. What are you going to do? <laughs> well, all I can say is that uh, I, I was very happy. I wouldn't say happy, but I was fortunate. Fortunate that I was able to be in the military and getting the education I got even at the Naval School of Music. I got exactly what I was promised. I was in short change. I met and up you with- you were hurt. I, you, know, you were never hurt. Never hurt. Uh, I, I, I had, there were some times that uh, were hard from time to time, but mm -hmm. that happens in life. But overall, I do it all over again. Okay. I, three words. Three words. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. We're going to have to wrap it up, folks. But before I go over in this, remember this. 211. If you or your friends think you might need some help and you qualify, please call that number. Bob Stevens saying thank you. If you're interested in doing your show, the address will be in the back of the program here. Give me a call. We'll make sure that you're well treated and it'll be one of the happiest moments of your life. Until then, Stay healthy. Goodbye.